Greetings and welcome to another lecture in psychopathology. I'm going to be continuing my discussion of the stimulants in this video. Starting, or, well, starting this video anyway, we're talking about what I like to call your basic everyday stimulants. Now these are stimulants that are legal, that are over the counter, and that an awful lot of people have used and in the case of the first uh, particular stimulant. I won't say almost everybody, but I will say a whole lot of people. I would say definitely majority of the American population have used this, and this is caffeine. In fact, caffeine is so commonly used that a lot of people don't even think of it as a drug, really. A lot of people that rail about taking drugs and how they never use drugs and so forth, they still have to have their cups of coffee or tea or pop or soda or whatever, uh, energy drinks. So they all need to have caffeine. Caffeine is very, very, very commonly used. It is indeed found in coffee, tea, and cola. It's also found in energy drinks. It's found in alternate amounts, basically, for each. And I'm going to show you a table real fast in a minute about, basically, general amounts of caffeine in various beverages. But I do want to point out that even though this is so widely used, I mean, it's caffeine, it's extremely widely used, you can still become dependent on it. You could still develop a tolerance. Ask anybody who started off drinking a small cup of coffee and now needs a whopping massive huge cup of coffee in order to get the same effect. And you can also show withdrawal symptoms when you go off of it. Ask anybody who hasn't had their coffee and now has a massive headache. Uh, coffee generally does have more caffeine in it than tea and cola. Energy drinks vary and half the time energy drinks don't tell you how much caffeine is in them. They don't have to simply because it's considered a food supplement and therefore they don't have to tell you how much caffeine is in it. Um, in fact, there are some energy drinks out there that have a dangerously high amount of caffeine in them. And uh, all I can say is that if you're not sure how much caffeine is in something, don't drink the whole can at one shot. There are some types of energy drinks that are meant basically to be, you don't drink the whole can, you drink an, a small amount of the can. Because if you drink the whole can, you may wind up like some people I've known that were awake for 36 hours with their heart pounding and their head pounding and just, you know, it, it was not pleasant. And it's a good thing they didn't have any underlying cardiovascular problems because it could have gotten a whole lot more unpleasant. You can overdose on caffeine. It takes a lot, but you can do it. So because you have the potential for dependence here, there's also the dependence for withdrawal. Like I said, people who don't have their coffee or their tea or their cola. And yes, you can become dependent on caffeine from tea and cola, even though there's a lot less caffeine in it, depending on how sensitive you are to caffeine, which appears to at least be partly genetic, as well as how much you drink. But for these withdrawal are generally more annoying. They're not really deadly. You're not going to need to be hospitalized. You're going to be very grumpy, I suspect. But it's, it's not generally considered to be dangerous. They're not that strong of a stimulant. And therefore, most people don't wind up getting hooked to the point that going off of it is dangerous. There will probably be a lot of sleeping. But since there will also probably be a headache, the sleeping might be welcome. Here is a chart that gives an idea of how much is in each of these beverages. Now, this is an older chart because I can't find a newer one that pleases me. Um, and it includes, you know, Jolt soda. People don't necessarily remember Jolt. It marketed itself as something along the lines of all the sugar and twice the caffeine, uh, which I always found very amusing. And it comes pretty close if you look at it. Uh, it's got twice as much caffeine in it as Pepsi does. Uh, so basically, one thing I want to note is that uh, look at the amount here. Uh, the sodas give you an amount both in 8 ounces, which is one cup, which is considered a standard serving, as well as a 12-ounce can to give you an idea of how much is in each can. Most sodas, by the way, will also tell you how much caffeine is in them. Brewed coffee, depending on how strong it is, it's 60 to 120 milligrams per 8-ounce cup. Although I will point out to you that I've almost never seen anyone drink anything out of an 8-ounce cup. The smallest cups that I have seen in terms of things like mugs are between 12 and 16 ounces. So basically you're looking at two servings. 
And a lot of the beverage, coffee beverages that people drink are along the lines of the 26 to 32 ounces. Yes, people go wandering around with quarts of coffee. Or if you go and refill your mug enough times, it works out to the same thing. Um, decaf coffee has much less. Espresso has 30 to 50 milligrams of caffeine per one ounce. That's a shot, essentially. A shot is one ounce. Black tea uh, has a little more caffeine than green tea. They both come from the tea plant, but uh, they're processed slightly differently. And with tea, it depends partly on the type of tea you have and also how long you brew it. Generally, the longer you brew it, the stronger it is, both in taste and in caffeine. A lot of teas that are marketed as herbal teas are actually not teas at all. They have no tea, uh, no tea leaves in them. More technically, they should be called tisanes, uh, but uh, they're called teas because you, you brew it. It looks a lot like a tea, even though it isn't. And generally, herbal teas do not have caffeine in them because they don't have tea leaves in them. The caffeine comes from the tea leaf in the same way that the caffeine in coffee does come from the coffee bean. Chocolate has caffeine in it, or at least it has something similar to caffeine. I have always been told that what, what uh, chocolate has is kind of uh, caffeine's first cousin, and that it's not technically caffeine, but it has the same effect. And again here, the darker the chocolate, the more you're going to have. Now, the usual question when people see this that they ask is, okay, how much coffee do I drink before I become dependent? And as I mentioned before, it depends on the person. It depends on any genetic susceptibilities. It depends on a lot. But the usual line that is drawn in the sand is somewhere around 350 milligrams a day of caffeine, which if you drink coffee is relatively easy to get to. If you drink sodas or pops, it might take you a little longer, but it is indeed possible to get there. I do know people that drink enough soda or coffee, particularly if you or soda or, or or pop, particularly if you like to go to your local convenience store and get, you know, the the 32 ounce jugs. Um, I had a friend once who would drink a 32 ounce jug of Mountain Dew, and notice Mountain Dew actually has more caffeine in it than Coke or Pepsi. Would drink a 32 ounce jug of Mountain Dew right before he went to bed and wonder why he had trouble sleeping. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to that other very, very common over-the-counter stimulant, which is nicotine. Now, much like cocaine, uh, nicotine is, has been uh, evolved by certain plants as an insecticide. It basically is there so that uh, individuals who, uh, well, bugs, presumably, who chew on the leaves wind up dying. It's a pesticide. And you can actually kill bugs. You can actually kill a lot of things with tobacco, including people, <laughs> by the way. Uh, it, it takes a lot of nicotine to, to kill you, but, you know, that's it, it can indeed happen. Um, another interesting thing about nicotine is people often don't realize that nicotine is indeed a stimulant because they say, well, when I smoke it, it relaxes me. There's a little bit of evidence that nicotine may have some anti-anxiety properties. We're not sure. It's long been assumed that the relaxation that people feel when they smoke nicotine is because they're relieving their withdrawal symptoms. If you have withdrawal symptoms and you smoke, the withdrawal symptoms are going to go away and that's going to make you feel better. That's going to make you relax because you no longer have that headache. You no longer have those jitters. You no longer have that desire to get the nicotine. And boy, is there a desire. Uh, I've seen rankings of how habit-forming various drugs are. And nicotine is right there at the top. It may not be the absolute top, but boy, it's more habit-forming than opiates are. It's more habit-forming than other stimulants are. It is right up there, basically, in terms of uh, how easily it hooks people. It hooks people easy, and it hooks people hard. Now, when people try to kick nicotine, the physical dependence is gone in about two weeks. After that, the body has basically rearranged itself, has gone back to the way that it was before. So it can function properly without the nicotine. We do indeed have nicotine receptors in our body, therefore a particular neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is used in all sorts of things. It's used in movement, it's used in memory, it's used in lots of stuff. And uh, these receptors are called nicotinic receptors because nicotine binds to them. 
and if you flood your body with nicotine, your body will stop making this acetylcholine, and therefore it will, uh, you know, it will be relying on the nicotine, and it takes a while to ramp that back up. But that very often is the source of the withdrawal symptoms. While the physical dependence is gone in two weeks or so, the psychological dependence, which is often much, much stronger, can last for years, can last for decades in some cases. There are people who haven't smoked or used tobacco in, in 20 years who still occasionally just get this really strong urge to use. It, it is just amazing at how habit forming it is. Now, I also want to point, take a moment to point out that in terms of smoking, it is not the nicotine that kills you unless you do an overdose, which is relatively rare. When people smoke cigarettes or they smoke tobacco in leaf form, in, in any form really, what tends to cause the cancer and whatnot are the tars and smokes and the crud basically that people are inhaling. Vaping may have its own dangers, particularly if the vaping liquid has been cut by any sort of substance that people don't know about. There was a big rash of people in uh, 2019 who were getting very, very sick from va vaping, uh, specifically marijuana, tetrahydrocannabinol products. And it was because those products that were often uh, created illegally in states where marijuana is not legal, and also by people who just wanted to make a buck, would, uh, were often cut with something that was actually damaging the lungs. Now, we're not sure that vaping itself doesn't damage the lungs. In the current coronavirus pandemic that is going on, it appears that people who vape are also slightly more susceptible to the pneumonia that can result from coronavirus infection. Perhaps not as susceptible as people who smoke actual cigarettes and cigars and pipes. But still, vaping is probably not harmless either. It is, however, better than smoking cigarettes and cigars and pipes. Now, quitting smoking is a very, very big business here, and uh, there are various techniques. They all have about the same quit smoking rate. One of the things that might be working better that I'm not sure was included in this is actually using vaping to taper down on the amount of nicotine that is ingested. A lot of the habit for, that is being formed with people who smoke is doing something with their hands, doing something with their mouths, and so vaping allows them to still have that sort of rewarding behavior while reducing the amount of the nicotine that is the actual habit-forming chemical. So it actually may be useful to vape for a while until that um, the amount of nicotine that a person vapes is down to zero, and then presumably kicking the vaping, although the vaping companies don't want you to do that. Uh, what is kind of horrifying to me anyway is that the people who have the highest rate of quitting are people who have been hospitalized for smoking-related diseases. People with lung cancer, throat cancer, other types of oral cancer. Uh, smoking can definitely do a number. It's not just lung cancer, it's all sorts of cancers. But I also have to point out that there are people who have, or, who are literally dying of lung cancer or oral cancers who will still smoke. I have seen people smoking through a tracheotomy that has been cut into their windpipe through their neck, that little pipe there, because they can't breathe through their larynx anymore, for instance, because they had cancer of the larynx. And they still need to smoke so badly that they will smoke through that little hole in their neck. This is a wicked, nasty drug in terms of being habit forming and in terms of being fatal. The only reason that it's legal now is because it's tradition in the United States to grow and use tobacco. It's one of the first crops that got grown here commercially after, of course, the earliest settlers learned smoking from the Indians, the Native Americans. Um, so I highly recommend that you do not allow yourself to become dependent on nicotine even if you're vaping it, I also highly recommend that if you are, you do your best to get off of it. I know it's incredibly difficult, but it really will help you a lot if you can, if not get off of it, reduce it dramatically. Because, you know, the, the various ways we have of getting nicotine in are not particularly good for us. And this is one that there is no safe level of use.